Good morning, everybody. It's 9.15, so uh, let us start. Um, <clears throat> we started last week what is called ranked retrieval, which is a very different way of indexing and querying documents that we've, than we've seen before, which was Boolean retrieval. Um, and today we are going to continue. I will remind you a little bit of uh, what it involved, and then we will see how to modify the indices, how to compute the indices, and uh, compute the queries in order to, uh, to uh, rank the documents. And then hopefully as well today, uh, we will look into how to, how to optimize it a little bit further. I will try to um, wrap that up today, so I shortened a little bit the lecture, so that next week we can look into uh, have a special probabilities lesson with probabilistic information uh, retrieval. Um, so what we are going to see today is the last uh, items in the lecture for which you are going to have programming assignments. Then there will be more theoretical exercises on probabilistic information retrieval. And then we are going to look in the lectures into some alternate models. Uh, but uh, with the exercises, I will uh, give you a bit more of, uh, um, of your time back. So ranked retrieval. Um, let us start. I, I, I really like to start with a few questions to uh, reactivate what we've seen the last few times. So first, do you remember that the whole point of ranked retrieval is to score documents? You know, in, instead of returning documents in a set, either a document matches the query or it does not, that's what we did with Boolean retrieval, with scores, we had to find a way to assign numbers to the documents. The first idea that we had who remembers what we first did before the vector spaces, does anybody remember? We looked into document metadata, right? Title, abstract, and so on. Um, and the first thing that I told you is that you could have queries, and that was the case in the old times in libraries, where you have exact matches on some metadata, such that the language of a book, the title of a book, the abstract of a book, and so on. And my question here, here is to reactivate what we've done last time. What is the best way to deal with that if you want to have an information retrieval system that is based on the metadata of the books, not of, of the full text of the book, but the metadata? So what is the best way to deal with queries on documents metadata? I'm giving you a bit of time to uh, wake up yourself and also your uh, smartphone. 13. Can you raise your hands if you need more time? Ready? Okay. So let's look at the results. Yes, you're correct. Because if you index metadata and look for a language, a price, an exact title, the author of a book, this is a classical database problem. And I actually have nothing to teach you here because that was already covered in the information systems lectures that you had uh, a bit earlier. Um, and what kind of indices do you use? Uh, oh, I put it in the, in the question. So you have the hash indices and the B3 and B plus 3 indices. Can you very quickly remind me what's the difference between the two in terms of capabilities? What can you do with the one and not with the other? Yes? Yes, exactly. With the hash index, you can only do point queries, but not range queries. So if you have prices or years of publication, then maybe a B3 is better than a hash index. For authors, you could use a hash index because I don't know many people who query in ranges for authors. You could always imagine, but you need to pick your indices carefully. Um, nobody answered the metadata is so small. Um, it, it, look like, it looks like... Um, a fancy answer this thing and so here of course it's the wrong answer but do not underestimate in practice you will probably have to deal with problems when you are working in the industry when you have to solve um, some some um, issues dealing with data do not underestimate the number of cases where a brute force approach actually is much faster than anything else because the data is so small this is something extremely important. We talk a lot now of um, uh, you know, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes of information. 
Uh, in the lectures, we throw at you how to use MapReduce and clusters of machines. Uh, we even had an entire lecture on how to compress uh, the indices into memory. We had an entire lecture dedicated to how we construct the index, if it doesn't fit in memory, if it's on the disk. For many systems, we need all that. But it's not because you know all of that that you have to use it for absolutely every single system. In many cases in real life, you will have data sets that are so small that it's an overkill to use all of these technologies. So I'm giving you these tools. It doesn't mean that you have to use them all the time, right? Uh, so the standard inverted index here uh, does not apply because it's not a full text. Here I really mean the document metadata with exact matches or range matches. So this is the reason. The standard inverted index is really here if you have full text searches. You would use a standard inverted index if you do want to query the title and the abstract as full text then yes, you can use the standard inverted index. And we even saw that in that case, we can merge the standard inverted indices for the body of the book, the title, the abstract, into a single one. You remember that, right? Who does? Some of you do. Okay. So I encourage you to look again at the slides of last week. Okay. So now another understanding questions to be absolutely sure that at all times, you are aware of what we are doing. I told you, we are abstracting away from, from, from what a document is. So in a book, a book is simply, what is, what is a book mathematically without information loss? It's a list of words, right? If you forget about the formatting and so on. So now that we index documents, maybe we want to treat them as lists of words, maybe we want to treat them as sets of words, maybe as bags of words, maybe as maps of words to, uh, to something else. Um, it's okay to lose information, and whenever you, you have a general challenge or a general problem to solve, you need to find the right level of abstraction. And the reason why I'm insisting on that is that in the lecture, we do not do always the same model of abstraction. We, we change it depending on the topic, right? So I want to check that you're absolutely clear in the vector space model which one we are using. A set of words, list of words, maps of words to documents or bags of words. Note that this is a purely mathematical question. These are abstract data types, not actual implementations. So 13, let's take a look. Yes, bags of words. So you got that. So I guess I don't have much to say. Lists of words, no, because we lose the ordering of the words. We do not care about the ordering of the words in the vector space model. OK, so you got that. That's perfect. Then at some point, I told you that we needed some machine learning. And I even didn't go much into details of that thing. So what did we use machine learning for? Do we need to use machine learning to rank the documents in the vector space model? So we train the documents in some way, and then, boom, it outputs the, uh, the overall score. Or is it in order to construct the standard inverted index uh, in an optimal way that we train on plenty of different collections, learning how the standard indices are built, and then you, you, you can build the real standard inverted index with that machine learning model? Or is it in order to find optimal ways to score documents in zone queries based on some data sets in which some humans told you uh, if documents are relevant or not? Or is it in order to display the results to the users in a way they understand? If you have a data set of users and their reactions, for example, you track their eyes on the screen and so on. So when do you most likely use machine learning in there? Very good. It was the, uh, it's in order to find the weights to score the documents in zone queries. And probably this must be very intuitive to you because, in essence, if you, have, um, um, if you have to find the optimal weights, this is 
almost a one-to-one -one mapping with machine learning. You have some features that you want to map to some, uh, uh, to like in that case, uh, a regression, and um, you want to optimize, uh, to minimize the uh, overall error. So this is an absolutely direct application of machine learning to find optimal weights, and these are just, in the end, the parameters of your model that you finally find. Okay, for the rest, I'm not saying that you would not use machine learning, but typically you don't. Um, in order to rank the documents, we will actually see today how you do that. You don't need any machine learning. It's purely looking through the index and so on. Constructing the in standard inverted index, you all remember that we don't use any machine learning. And displaying the results to the user, it's a bit outside of the scope of the, uh, of the lecture, uh, where you can use snippets of the documents to show, but of course, no machine learning in there. Okay, very good. And now I wanted to um, have a concrete, and these are, these are typically, in the end, questions, typical questions that you can have on the exam where I give you uh, concrete documents or concrete uh, uh, indices and so on, and then you have to work formally on these very uh, documents to give answers. This is one of the many kinds of questions you could have. So let's fire uh, some of them here. Try to answer as quickly as possible. It's not the exam, it's no big deal if you don't get the answer, but it's a good training to know that you absolutely master the terminology, term frequency, document frequency, collection frequency. So what is the term frequency of term A? So 1, 4, 11, or the question doesn't make sense. What is the term frequency of term A? As quick as possible, try to... Uh, Three more. And 13. No 13? Okay, I'll just give you, oh yes, okay. Perfect. Oh, interesting. The actual answer is this question doesn't make sense. So it shows that I, it was a good idea to, uh, to go through that. The term frequency is always per term and document. If I ask you for the term frequency, I'm giving you a term in the document. This doesn't make any sense. I cannot ask you for just the term frequency of a term. Doesn't make any sense, okay? So then, and this is the correct way to formulate it, what is the term frequency of term A in document three? This is, this is then an easy one. Of course, I'm crossing my fingers that I, that I marked all the right answers correctly here, because that's quite a lot of questions. So what's the term frequency? Very quick, that's really an easy question. Nine, 11, 13. Yes, this is one, because the term frequency is simply the number of time that that term occurs in the document. And you see why we need the bag of words, because if we had sets of words, we wouldn't know that, we would have lost this information. This is why it's very important to have a bag of words. Okay, so now, what is the collection frequency of term A? It's always the same set of documents. You don't need to check if it changed or if it didn't change. It's probably the one that you may have confused with the first question, which is now the proper terminology. 13? 14, oh, very good. Yes, it's 11. The collection frequency is the total number of occurrences in collection. It's the sum of the term frequencies summed over the documents, okay? Okay, next one. What is the inverted document frequency of term A? Oh, maybe I didn't order them in the, uh, by difficulty level. So, can you tell me the inverted document frequency of term A? Yes? 
0, 1, 3, or 4. For this, you probably need to remember the formula that I gave you for the inverted document frequency. Even in the name inverted document frequency, you do have an indication. And let's see if you fall in the trap. 12, two more, 13, 14, yes, okay. Ah, interesting. So four is the document frequency. Four is the number of documents in which term A appears. So this is not the inverted document frequency. Um, one, one, how did you get that? You probably divided the total number of documents by four. So four divided by four gives you one. What did you miss here? One thing that you forgot. Can anybody tell me who answered zero? Yes? Your feeling is correct. Yeah. So your feeling is correct that the idea is that if, if it appears everywhere, there is zero information. Um, but mathematically, what is the one mathematical thing? What, what turns one into zero mathematically? Anybody? Three letters. It's the log. The inverted document frequency is the log of the number of documents divided by the document frequency. How should I index it? What is in the index here? Document, term, term and document. Makes you think, right? It's very important to have this thing absolutely correct. So is it an inverted document frequency for each term, or for each document, or for each pair of term and documents? Yes? For each term. For each term. So here I need to put some term here. The document frequency is per term, the number of documents in which it appears, and also the inverted document frequency, and then you have this magic formula. Log of 4 divided by 4 gives us log of 1, which is 0. Okay? Uh, so this one we already did. Five. Oh yeah, that's the one I should have. I wanted to put it earlier. So very quickly, the document frequency of term D. It's the kind of things that, you, you know, there are several ways you can master something. When you learn a language, for example, you can know its grammar, its vocabulary, and you can make a sentence if you're given enough time. But this is not, it doesn't mean that you completely master the language. Mastering the language doesn't only mean that you know the grammar and the vocabulary, it also means that you can fluently let it out when you speak. And here, you may know if you think the document frequency, the term frequency, the IDF, and so on, you must know that fluently. You should not have to think about these things. It makes it much quicker to understand and to be absolutely clear that the document frequency is of a term, the term frequency is of a term in the documents, and so on and so on. Okay, we even have 16 answers now. So three, yes, because there's three documents that contain it. So the next one. What is the inverted document frequency of term C? I'm using the logarithm in base two logarithm in base two, just to keep things simple. Let me show the results, you can still vote. Yes, the answer is two, because there's only one document that contains it. Four, total number of documents divided by one gives you four, and the log in base two of four is two. Yes? Uh, oh, yes. 
let me let me think. No, no, there is no minus. It's four four divided by one. This is always this is always bigger than one because this this is necessarily greater than this, right? This is the total number. Yeah, you would need a minus if you if you swap this. Yeah, but it's exactly you need to ask yourself these kinds of questions. So log of four divided by one gives you two. Okay. So you can see here why the inverted document frequency is about rarity. Because the, doc, the, the inverted document frequency of A was zero. A is everywhere. A is not rare. Zero. C is very rare. Because if you query for C, document three is extremely relevant. Because three is the only one. Document three is the only one that has term C. So you can see that this is a high inverted document frequency. Right? Uh, OK. It's actually the maximal. Uh, inverted document frequency, because the, then you would have zero if something is even rarer, but then you cannot even define that. So the log of n is the maximum inverted document frequency you can have. Okay, so I think six, I already did. What is the TFIDF of term C? Quick, 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 this is easy. You should react instantly here. Six, seven, let me show. Aha. So is it two or does it not make sense? Very good. Yes. Absolutely. TFIDF doesn't make sense. It's per term, per document, because the term frequency is per term in documents. And finally, and now this time it's asked in the right way, what is the TFIDF of C in document three? Remember, you don't need to compute everything from scratch because you already computed some stuff in previous questions. So if you remember part of this information, you can be very fast here. Very good. 14 is, so the term frequency is 7. There are 7 of it. And the IDF is 2. We already computed it, log of 4 over 1. So it's 14. Perfect. So I'll stop annoying you with that. But it proved useful, because now you should master this completely. Okay, It's very important, because we, we will talk a lot about these things. Document frequency, collection frequency, TF, IDF. You must really have it correctly record it. And the subsidiary question, still with the same thing, which one of the following is the standard inverted index for this collection? Is it this thing? Is it this thing? Is it this thing? Or is it this thing? Can you see it properly on your screens? Or should I show it again? Does anybody want me to show it again? The answers? OK, I'm assuming you can see it correctly. Every word here is absolutely important in the question. A. 
eights. Eleven, five more. We had sixteen earlier. Thirteen, three more. Fourteen, make up your minds. Fifteen, and one more. We're missing one. Yes. So let us see. Nobody voted for that one. Everybody voted for that one. I'm very, very happy. Means you got it. Yeah. So, very quickly, this is absolutely wrong. Got it all wrong because we have the documents here and we should have the terms. So, this is why. And here, this is why I actually, maybe you would have fallen in the trap if I had asked you this question next week and not this week. But the idea is very simple. This here is actually the index we will get for ranked retrieval when we actually want to use the, uh, the cosine computations and so on. So this is an enhanced inverted index specific to uh, ranked retrieval. And this is the standard, and this is why I insist on standard inverted index. It is the first one we've seen in the first week, standard inverted index. All you have here is the document IDs and the document frequencies, right? Okay, very, very good. So now, it was worth it. I, I wasn't sure if it would be worth it. I thought you will get everything right, but it was worth it. We, we could um, refresh a few things. Very good. So these are the, the high level things to remember, right? Boolean retrieval, you have queries like this with some grammar with and or not and so on, and you output a set of documents. Ranked retrieval is a full free text query, just the ones you type under Google and you want to rank the documents. So we've been through all of that. We've seen parametric search. We've seen uh, a first way to score, and the first way to score was done with this idea of using zones, body, title, abstract. And then we saw this beautiful formula, which is just a scalar product, right? So this is the first ever system we built that had scoring, okay? So now I'm fast forwarding again. We've seen all that. Um, then we've seen that's the machine learning approach that I didn't insist on. And here, super important, set of words was the Boolean queries, and we migrate now to bag of words. We'll go back to set of words next week. But now we switch to bag of words. It means we still ignore the order, but we care about the number of occurrences. So this, we've done it so much in the questions that I don't need to teach you anything anymore, you know all of that. Um, and then, this is the interesting part. We started looking into documents as vectors, but not vectors of booleans, as we did before, vectors of actual numbers. And what you can have in there, by default, the first thing I told you is TFIDF. We'll see that we can put other things in there, but the very simple, naive answer is you put the TFIDFs in these vectors, like the 14 that you computed for C in document three. Um, so we put the TFIDFs in there, and you can see it makes all sense because you have one TFIDF per term and documents. This is the vector corresponding to one document, and we do it for each term. So every of these numbers here is indexed by term and documents. Okay, and then we saw that we can have this beautiful abstraction of documents instead of having this as a document. This is actually just a point over there. This is a point, right, or a vector, if, depending how you look at it. So this is a point in some, in some big space. In the first quadrant, because it's all positive, you never have anything there or there. Okay. And then uh, we saw that we could renormalize stuff. We love it when things are renormalized. So much easier to handle. So we're using the Euclidean norm. It's one of the ones we can use. I'll show you later there's other ways, but the Euclidean norm allows us to renormalize a document to something that has a length of one. So whenever we have a document, we divide by the Euclidean norm and come here. We also saw that last week, so this is why I'm very fast. All you need to do is divide here by the norm. And then you normalize, this is what you get. So if you normalize something and what you get is not between zero and one, then you have a problem. It means that something went wrong with the Euclidean norm. Why am I saying that? Because everything is positive. If it could be negative, 
but everything is positive. I don't want to say incorrect things in there, so I'm backing up on that. Everything here should be between 0 and 1, and then you know uh, it makes sense. So this is the renormalization. Then we looked into one more thing. We looked into the inner product between two vectors that is obtained. It has to do with the angle, uh, which is obtained by the scalar product, where you just sum over the product of the coordinates. Okay? That's the scalar product. And then if you renormalize it, that's even better, because then you get the cosine of the angle. And the cosine of the angle is exactly the one thing that we want to have when we compute the similarity between two documents. Because remember, the cosine, when it's like this, is 1. Cosine 1 means absolutely similar. And cosine of 0 means that it's the extreme, that one document is over there, the other document is there. OK? So very similar document, cosine close to 1. Very different documents, cosine is much smaller. OK? But maybe you're going to tell me, what's the point of computing similarity between documents? Who cares? But the thing is, the queries can also be considered vectors. And this is why this is so beautiful. Because a query is also a bag of words. So you can also construct the vector in exactly the same way. You can also renormalize them and so on. And then you can do the computation of the cosine between the query and each document. So here's one of them, for which the cosine is very big. It's close to 1. The angle is close to 0. And that means, and that's an interpretation, one way to do that. That makes sense. If the cosine is close to 1 and the query and the document are almost aligned, then the document is a very good candidate for results to the query. Who understands intuitively why that's the case? OK, very good. So, and this is another example that these documents are very good results of Q1. OK, so we now have a methodology to do information retrieval based on that, all you need to do is uh, if I give you a query and a bunch of documents, just go ahead and compute the cosine of the angle between the query and each one of the documents in the collection. And then instantly you are going, going to tell me that's way too much because we could have billions of documents in the collection, so there is no way that you are going to compute the cosine one billion times with each document. So of course there will be, there are much better ways of doing that. There's two problems, actually, that we have it there. The first problem is the very large number of documents. You could have billions of these blue points here. And the second problem is the very high number of dimensions. You could have hundreds of thousands of terms in there, right? The number of dimensions is the total number of distinct terms, or types if you, don't, if you group them in equivalence classes with lemmatization and so on. So we have these two problems. How do we get rid of these two problems? So the first thing to consider is, so imagine I want to compute this scalar product. So I have a query here expressed as a vector of renormalized TF-IDFs. And I have a document here expressed as a vector also of TF-IDFs. What can you tell me about this if you want to compute the scalar product? There's, let's say, 500,000 uh, rows here. What can you tell me about that? Is it hard to compute? How hard is this to compute? So now think, yes? Yes, exactly. The query should be quite sparse. And that means, what does that mean for that vector? Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. In practice, the query is so small that you don't actually need to compute everything here. You can just drop that. All you need to do is compute the product of the coordinates where this is not null. Very good. That's one very important aspect. So we got rid of the number of dimensions. That's already a very good thing. Um, and this is static. Static, I, I have to be very careful with static. It's not static because it depends on the query, but it does not depend on the documents. Imagine that you still need to do it with one billion documents. The terms you need to consider, they are given by the query. They do not change with the documents. Okay? So this means that we really have less dimensions in there. So now, we need to compute. What did I do here? Oh, I just put a reminder. This is the reminder of, that we want the cosine of the two vectors divided by the norm. So that gives us the cosine of the, of the angle. 
And this is a measure of similarity. Uh, oh, yes, because I wanted to put it in that form. I wanted to explain that what we want to compute is really, in the end, this formula, which is the, the sum of the coordinates and divided by the norms. But if I take out the sum here, what I need to do is really for each term and document, uh, I need to, uh, to multiply this product. And this actually gives you a pretty good algorithm or way in order to, uh, to compute this. Because in practice, what we have here, the coordinates here, these are the TFIDFs, right? And what better place to store the TFIDFs if we want to execute a query? Well, a good place to start with is the standard inverted index. So we have this standard inverted index. We used it for Boolean queries, but we love to recycle things. So why don't we recycle that for ranked retrieval? So remember that in the case of Boolean retrieval, we scanned like this and computed inter intersections of uh, posting lists. But if, if you think about that, what we want to do in terms of um, high level picture is also a traversal. We also want to traverse the documents. We also want to traverse the terms. But we, do, we need extra information because here it's a set of word model. We only have the documents. So we would need extra information in there. So we would need to store additional things. So the first idea that you could have is for each document and term, I have a TFIDF. So remember that in here, whenever you have one of these squares, this is a term document pair. This is document three paired with CPU, even if it's on the left. So every time I have a TFIDF, so I could store for each one of these postings here, I could store the TFIDF. And then you can see the algorithm is very easy to understand. Then when you query, all you need to do is just accumulate these, uh, these uh, TFs, IDF multiplied by those of the query, right? But let's stick to the storage for now, not the actual computation. We want to store the pre-computed TF IDF in there. Why is that a bad idea? This is the naive solution. Why is it a bad idea? So what is a TF IDF? What is that for a term in a document? Yes? Yes, it depends. It will be different for every rectangle, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Each time you add a term or you add a document, the aggregation for all of them. OK, I see. so basically you're talking about online uh, index construction, where you keep adding documents. So you're right that you would have some extra efforts to do if you, if you, if you have to update the index regularly. Um, I would like to keep this thing out of the picture just for today. So assume we don't have online index construction. We just have a collection. We index it statically, and then we get this index. And it's still not a good idea, even if you don't have online index construction, to have the TFIDFs in there. Anybody else? So what, what is it mathematically, the TFIDF, given the term document? What is this? Is it a vector? Is it a Boolean? Is it a number? Yes? A float, for example, a float, yes. And I'm glad you didn't say integer, because yes, that's a float. So why is it problematic to have floats in there? Float is just 32 bits, right? Just like an integer. So what's the big deal? But do you remember what we spent one week on? Yes? Yes, exactly. I showed you how to compress all of that, how to compress when you have integers. So in integers, we have we had where the doc ID is, right? But if we add integers, if we could have integers in there, we could still compress with the gamma codes and so on. But if we have floats, we can no longer do that because floats are not compatible with compression in the same way, right? So it's undesirable to store the pre-computed TFIDFs. So how can we do it then? Yes? Yes, you could. You may have scalability or scale, scale issues, right? But you can always fall back to fixed point. Yes. Yeah. But the, it, it's not only about precision, because how precise you need to be with a float or a double, that's more or less what it is. If you are fixed point, it's not only about the precision. It's also about the, the exponents, because you, you cannot move the dots, right? So this is the issue that you would have. 
But how could, how could we ask differently? How could we have an integer in there? What, what could we take something in there that is an integer? We could take the term frequency, right? So this is what we do in practice. So in practice, what we store here is the term frequency. It's an integer every time we have a term frequency. And then you can compress, solve the problem, right? But you still not need to sort the IDF. But the good thing about the IDF is that it's per term, right? So you can store the IDFs right here, right? So you can store the TFs here and the IDFs here, and then you compute them at the last minute, right? In practice, so here I don't know all of the details why that is. You don't actually store the log, but you store n divided by df. I suspect, even though they don't actually explain it in the book, I suspect that it's also in order to have an integer. Because typically, this here, you can typically round as an integer without harming the system, and then again you have an integer. That's probably the reason. And then you compute the log actually online. And then for the query part, so here I talked only about the documents, right? I had a D here and I had a D here. Every time that's D. But now we need the same thing for Q, for the term and the query. But this is easy. I mean, on the query side, the query is so small that uh, this is the easy part, okay? So we're getting close to the break. To the break, don't worry. So the idea is very easy. Imagine we have that. We start the uh, TFs and the IDFs. And by the way, now I can show you that again, because that's actually what I did here. If you look at this here, this answer, that's exactly what I did. I actually put, so there's the document ID, and then I added the TF. These are all the term frequencies in there. And then I put here, I, I replaced the document frequencies with, in that case, directly the IDFs. So I didn't do what is in the book of just putting N divided by DF. So it is the log here. and. Uh, no, sorry, I did not compute the log. I did actually store n divided by tf, just redoing it. So that's 4 divided by 1, 4 divided by 3, 4 divided by 4. Yeah. So this is the standard inverted index. This is the enhanced inverted index, the one we use for rank retrieval. So all we need to do now is show you how to compute now the scalar product, the cosine similarity between a query and some documents. OK? And this is what we do after the break, yes? That's a very good point. I'm coming at it. it. It is actually in the next part of the lecture. This is a, it's very good to think about optimizations, right? What I'm doing here is first correctness. First you get something correct, and then you optimize, OK? Very good. So let's take a break, uh, 15 minutes. I'll see you at quarter past 10, and then we go through how to compute this, and then we'll optimize in, le in uh, series 8. OK, so uh, let's start again. Um, so, we were, let me directly jump, slides 140 something. So we were in the middle of looking into how we perform rank retrieval using the vector space model using an index. We saw that we can reuse the, uh, the same index as we had uh, the standard inverted index. We added some stuff in there. We added the term frequencies in each one of the postings in there for each term and documents. And we outsourced the inverted document frequencies for each document in there. Why? Because we want to still be able to compress, so we want integers in there, not doubles. Okay, so we have the IDFs in there uh, without computing the log, so just n divided by df. And then we assume that we have somewhere the same thing for the query, but this is the easy part. For the query, you can very easily compute the term frequencies uh, in the query and, uh, uh, and the inverted uh, document frequency, the inverted query frequency, if we want to call it with a fancy name. So now what we have left to do is the actual computation. So how, to, how do we do that? So remember what we have here. We have one query. The user has input one query into the system. And we are looking at 1 billion documents, and we want to rank them in order to return them. So what we are going to do is 
maintain here buckets, we call them accumulators, for each document. So I only have seven here, but it would be actually, from an abstract perspective, you have one billion of them. So you maintain one billion buckets uh, in here. And we are going to fill these buckets with the terms of the sum that we have in the cosine. We are going to scan through the documents, to scan through the terms, and every time we add to these buckets the, uh, the terms of the cosine calculation. So concretely, this is how it goes. Remember what the cosine is made of. The cosine is a sum over these things. That's the scalar product. If you have the sum over t over the terms of this ugliness here, what you get is the scalar product, the cosine. So all we need to do is accumulate these terms here for each t and d into these buckets. So here's how we do it. It's like a puzzle. We reassemble things together. So what do we have in here? We have, let's start with the easy part, the query norm. That's easy. It's static. Static meaning it only depends on the query. We have it somewhere, OK? Um, the document lengths. We can assume we pre-computed all the document lengths somewhere. And for each document, we have its length, OK? When I say length here, I mean the, the Euclidean length of the documents represented as a vector of TFIDFs, OK? So I have the document length right here. And then if I look at the numerator, what do I have here? I have the term frequency for each term in document. That's easy. That's what we have stored in each one of the postings right here. Then what do I have? I have the inverted document frequency for a term. It's right here, remember, for each term we stored it in here. You may have to do the log online, you know, in real time, because we didn't pre-compute the log, but that's very easy to do. So you compute the log of whatever number is in there. So we have this, we have this. The term frequency in the query, that's easy. You compute it once and for all for the query. It's, uh, it's the number of times that the term appears in the query. We'll come back at that later. And the IDF for the query, uh, is, uh, no, sorry, the IDF in general for the term, it's exactly the same as this one here, right? So you just square this number here, OK? Remember, there is one IDF per term. It doesn't depend on the document or on the query or anything. OK, so now you realize that we want to plus all of these things. So every time we have one of these numbers here, we look at what document it came from. And then we put it in the right buckets. So if here, for example, that was document, let's say, 6, if that was document 6, then we add this into that bucket, right? So here I took the example of 4. You plus it into that bucket. So what will you have at the end when you've done that for absolutely every posting for, for the terms you're looking for? Uh, you are going to have here the sum over t of these things by groups by documents. So you have the sum of all of these things for document four in here, the sum of all of these things for document five in there, and so on and so on. So what you will have at the end is the cosine between the query and each one of these documents. OK? Who is following me here? OK? All we are saying is we are finding a way to compute this cosine by looking at every single term of the cosine. So I can even draw, a, for those who maybe do not have a visual, I have a visual. So in the end, the cosine of theta for a document, I'm assuming I'm taking the query out of the picture, is the sum of some ugliness here that I index by t and d and summed over t. This is the very high level picture, right? The cosine of the angle for each document is the sum over the term of some absolutely ugly formula that you see here on the whiteboard. And then I can sort the documents by this, and the closer to one, the more relevant it is. Who's following me on that? OK. So now I need to actually implement that. So why don't I visualize these things as a matrix? So here. I have the terms, and here I have the documents, and I have A11, A12, and so on. And this is, in effect, what we compute here. 
for each d and t, we compute that. And then what do I do? I accumulate this by documents, so I actually group them here by documents, and I plus all of these in here into bucket one, and I plus these ones into buckets two, and so on and so on. So all I need to do is plus them by column, right? But the order in which you do that, and we will very quickly see, either you do it column by column, and you take the first column, then you do this plus this plus this plus this plus this, gives you column one, so you fill the first bucket. When you're done with the first bucket, you fill the second bucket, and so on. But there's another, another way of doing that. You could, you could um, scan it like this. So you could say, okay, this I put in the bucket, this one I put in bucket two, this one I put in bucket three, this one in bucket four, this one in bucket five, this one in bucket six. Then I do row two. I put this number here. I add it to bucket one, then I add it to bucket two, and I add it to bucket three, and so on. The result at the end is only the same. The only thing that changes is the order of the computations. Who agrees on that? Okay? It's just a matter of uh, algorithm. Okay, so now, very concretely, what I have just told you is, th is that either you do it term at a time, that you do the first row, then the second row, then the third row, and so on, and the buckets basically grow and grow over time at the same time, or you do it document at a time, meaning that you first fill the first bucket with all the terms, and once it's full, you fill the second bucket, and so on. These are the two ways of doing that. Okay? So visually, I even have visuals for that, so that you really see what's going on. I have a very simple query, ETH Zurich computer, Remember that I only care about the terms that are in the query because everything else is zero. Okay? So now I have in this uh, posting list, I have six documents. So that's why I have only six in there to simplify six buckets. And I assume that in there, I have all the TFs, the term frequencies stored in the postings, the inverted fre term frequencies in there, and so on. So what do I do? I do it term at a time, meaning I start with ETH and I do all documents. Then I will do Zurich, then I will do computer. So I compute the uh, ugliness you saw earlier for ETH and document one, the product of the TF IDF divided by the norms. I put it into bucket one. Then I do document two, still with ETH, and I add it to bucket two. Since it was zero initially, that's actually the first time you just put it in there. Then document three, document five, document six. I, I'm using these little uh, um, bars in order to actually model what is a double, like uh, a number. Okay, so term at a time, so I'm done with ETH. The buckets now contain parts of the scalar products, but only considering the term ETH. And then I care about Zurich, so I start with the first posting, document three, so I add it. You see, I added it, gets higher. Then document four, that was the first time. And then I'm done with Zurich, and then I go for computer, so I add, I accumulate then the uh, term for document one, then document two, then document four, and then document five, and I'm done. That's it. What I have at the end is my scalar product, right? Because then what I have is, in effect, I have accumulated the sum of these terms, the product of the TFIDFs, renormalized, over T, and I get the cosines. So what I have in there at the end are all the cosines, right? I'm going to redo it a second time, but document at a time, but the result is going to be exactly the same. Document at a time means document one for ETH, document one for computer. Then document two, ETH computer. Then document three, ETH Zurich. Then document four, Zurich computer. Then document five, ETH computer. And document six, just ETH. And that's exactly the same result. All I change is the, the order in which I added stuff. We understand now? Okay, great. So this is called term at a time and document at a time. I forgot to change the title, but this is actually document at a time. Okay? This is explained in the book. They don't have the visuals that I did, but you can read the book as well. So now, it doesn't matter if you did it term at a time or document at a time. Either way, at the end, you have accumulated the cosines. In each bucket, you have the cosine between the documents and the query. So what do you do now? What do I do? Just following you understood. What should I do now? 
I want to return my results. How do I return my results? Anybody? This should be, this is a very easy question, very high level. H how do I return my results now? What should I return? Yes? Yes? Yeah, exactly. I sort now all of my buckets, the big buckets first. How can I do that? I can use a priority queue or a heap, for example. You know what a heap is, remember? Like every node in the tree has a number that's bigger than all the children. That's a heap. Uh, so you have a priority queue. So the priority queue is the abstract data type, like the list, set, and map. And a heap is a possible implementation of that priority queue. And you probably know that the best you can get in performance is actually linear. You would think a heap, it can be used for sorting, so it's n log n. But no, actually, there is an algorithm that makes it linear. Who, who actually saw that? I'm not sure if that's covered in the algorithms lecture. Who knew that? OK, well, now you know it. OK? So you can use a priority queue with a heap, and then in linear time, get this sorted. And then all you need to do is step, take the top k, so the top 10, for example, if you're Google, and then display them to the user. And that's it. And we are done, right? We have performed information retrieval ranks. We first done the formalism and formalized it as scalar products. Then we have expressed the scalar products in a sum of some uglinesses of other terms. And then we've seen how we can sum them either term at a time or document at a time. And then we sort the buckets. We have the cosines. And we return the highest cosines. OK? Who understands now the big picture of that? Very good. So you know now ranked retrieval. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Sorry? Um, I didn't want to go into, into these details because that's really outside of the scope of the lecture. So the, the um, a heap, uh, how can I explain that without going into the details? So the times that I'm giving here are just construction times. In effect, I think it will be n log n whenever you sort something at the end. But the, uh, the, there is an algorithm in order to build a priority queue in some, uh, in some linear time. I think it's called the stock algorithm or something, the flock algorithm. I will double check that and give you an answer next week if you want, right? With the details, with more details of that. Of that. That's really out, outside of the scope of the lecture. So all I wanted to say here is we have a way to get that sorted and, uh, and to retrieve the top K, right? Um, maybe one of the answers um, let me try to find a very high level answer that is still, that still makes sense. Here's the answer. If you need to sort all of the documents, really all of the documents, this is going to be n log n. That was maybe why, why you worried about that, right? If you have n documents, you sort them in n log n, right? But what I'm saying here, and maybe this answers your questions, is that we do not want to actually sort all documents. We only want the top K. That's all we want. We don't care if the rest is sorted or not. So when I'm saying we sort the documents, this is virtual. We virtually, on the logical layer, sort the documents and take the top K. But since we do not actually need to compute here the, uh, the, the, the sorting of the documents we don't return, then this is why. Right? So this is why. We use a priority queue, and we only extract the top k of that priority queue. If we actually wanted to sort, we would also extract everything from the priority queue. And then you get n log n. OK? Did I answer your question? Yes? Yeah, OK, perfect. OK. But in the end, I think it's, I think it's very good you asked. I, I first wanted to keep it out of scope, but that's, that's actually a very good question. It's, it's always good to have this kind of um, automatic alerts, right? If, if I tell you you sort something in, in O of N, then it's very good that you have these alarms that, uh, that pop up, OK? So we only retrieve the top K, and this is why we, had, we have much better performance than if we sorted all the documents. So this is in order to extract them, the, uh, the time it takes. OK. And you can see where the n log n comes from. Because this is the time to extract one single item, log of n. But if you wanted to sort them all, then 
n time log n. So that's where you get the n log n. But what we get here is k log n. And k is a constant, so you get log n. So linear time to construct and log logarithmic time to uh, dq from the priority key. OK, so uh, I gave you more material than, than I intended, but I hope who understood that? Very good. So now you know even more. Perfect. So now I would like to tell you something more. Um, we did ranked retrieval, and this algorithm here works for any ugliness that we would have here, right? Whatever you put in there, you can use that algorithm. What we did is we used the TFIDFs, but we don't have to. We could use other weights in our vectors, and that's totally fine. So what I would like to give you now is some kind of a menu from which you can pick your weights. TFIDFs are one of those but you can do it differently. I invite you to look in the book. There is, could have actually made a slide out of that, but I didn't because you can just look at the book. And this is chapter six. So it's figure 6.15, page 118. You have a table, but everything in that table is what I'm showing you right now. So you just, you can then organize that in a table. But let me show you. So every time that we are looking at this formula here, the term, we have something about the term frequency, so the term documents. Then we have the IDF, something about the documents. And then we have the norm. These are the three items that you can pick a la carte. It's like the starter, the entree, the, for some weird reason they call it entree in, in, in the US, the main dish, and then the, uh, the dessert, right? It's exactly the same thing. You can pick the three elements. So here's the menu. For the term frequency, uh, you can use, well, just the term frequency. That's the first way of doing that. You can just use. Uh, the term frequency between T and D, and that's it. So what you get is then, then this uh, linear curve. Of course, it's linear because it's the identity function. I mean, you have the term frequency, you plot the term frequency, you get this, OK? But then the other ones are not that trivial. So the, f the second one is, it's called sublinear term frequency scaling. Uh, instead of the frequency, you use one plus log of the term frequency and zero otherwise. If, sorry, if it's, a, if it's strictly positive, because otherwise the log will uh, uh, not uh, exist, and zero if you're here. So what kind of curves do you think that uh, we are going to get with that? Let me show you. So it's sublinear, right? The answer is kind of in the, in the title. So sublinear means we are below that line here. So the weight, this means weight. The W means weight. So we take one plus log of the term frequency, and this is a log curve. So we get this curve here, and we just fix things. So of course, this would go to minus infinity right here, right? But to not let it go to minus infinity, we just put a zero in there, OK? So this is item two on the menu. In term, instead of the term frequency, you use that. Why would you do that? Well, you could argue that if the term frequency in the documents is extremely high, it doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, if you have a document with 100 times the word computer or with, um, sorry, with 100,000 times the term computer or with 200,000 times the term computer, the factor of two is an overkill because you don't have really much more information with 200,000 than 100,000. So instead of scaling it linearly, you just lose, use a logarithm. Right? That's the reason. So that could be another way of doing that. We have a third one, which is called the augmented term frequency scaling, which, uh, which is given by another formula here. And what it does is actually this. It, it, it pivots uh, the curve like this. It's in order to, uh, to change the behavior, to, to say, OK, if it occurs a lot, we, we diminish a little bit the score, because we don't want to uh, overweight them. And if it doesn't appear that often, we, we um, make it a little bit higher. So we just tilt the curve like that. And the way you do that is with this kind of a plus 1 minus a something else. Okay? 
That's the third way of doing that. The fourth way is actually very trivial. It's one if it's positive or zero. So what you have here is actually nothing else than a Boolean uh, model, right? Either the term appears in the document or it doesn't. So you have one here or zero. That's a fourth way of doing that. I think there is a fifth, which is the log average term frequency scaling. And this, is, this formula is also, uh, it looks complicated, but really what it is about is really the curve. So the curve is more like that. Uh, where you have here, it's not uh, exactly li linear in there. It's a little bit less, but you also get this kind of logarithm curve. I, I don't really want to go into the details of, wha of what this formula, why this formula, and so on and so on. The only thing that I'm saying here to you in terms of information is there is this menu, and you can pick five different formulas, or maybe even more if uh, you have imagination. So this one, this one, this one, this one, or this one, where this one is the standard one that we've been taking until now. Okay? So we have five choices in there, and, uh, and that's it. And then it's a matter, I, will, I was going to say a matter of taste, but it's more a matter of use case. What do your documents look like? Are you indexing technical documents? Are you indexing an FAQ? Are you indexing books and so on and so on? Then you can ask yourself questions. What does the term frequency mean for the use case that I have? And then you pick the one that you prefer, okay? You can do that for the query and for the document. So you have actually two choices. You can take a TF scheme for the query and a TF scheme for the document. Okay, so that's what's for the term frequency. Now we can do the exact same thing for the document frequency. So the first thing we can do for the document frequency is simply not use any. Just say we, 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 uh, we have the natural scaling, and that's it. So that's, that's n. We don't multiply with anything. We just take the term frequency, and we don't care about rarity. That's the first way we could do that. It's probably a bad idea for the documents, but on the query side, maybe that's a good idea. And then we have the good old inverted document frequency that you already know, that actually looks like that. I don't think I ever showed you the curve, but it starts with log n. I told you the log of the total number of documents is the maximum value for the IDF. And then it goes all the way down to zero. And then we saw if it appears in all documents, you get zero. So this is the one we've been using until now, the, uh, the IDF. Turns out there is a third one that has to do with probability estimates. We'll do probability next week, uh, next week so we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. I, I don't think I will explain to you why it is that way still, but just so you know, it's on the menu as well. What happens there is that it actually goes to zero already at half of the documents. That's, that's the difference. And it's motivated by probability models that I don't want to go into. Okay? So I have five items on the menu for the term frequency, I have three on the menu for the document frequency, and I have now the third part of the menu, the dessert, is the normalization. How can you normalize? The first way to normalize is to not normalize at all. So you just do not normalize, and that's it. The second one is the one we've been using, the cosine normalization, okay? So cosine normalization is just the Euclidean, we divide by the Euclidean norm. Okay, that's what we've been doing until now. The third one, it's a different way of normalizing. Instead of normalizing by Euclidean length of TFIDFs, you just normalize by the char length, the number of chars in the documents, to some exponents wi with some choice of A. Maybe it's easier to compute that the TFIDF, that may be, uh, the, well, well, than normalizing over the Euclidean norm over the TFIDFs. So that's a third way. So I give you Oh, there is a, a, a fourth one, actually, which is the pivoted normalization. It's actually very interesting, that one. It's a different way. You actually tilt the curve. It's exactly the same idea of what we saw earlier. Um, because you may have um, the issue that if you, do, if you just renormalize with the Euclidean norm, you may have issues that the, uh, the documents that are very long and that have a lot of terms in the documents may have a very high, maybe, maybe um, um, privileged in the query uh, compared to the, uh, to the documents that have less. 
What I mean here is that if you do empirical analysis of the collections, you find out that the Euclidean norm is really not ideal because it overweights large documents with a, a lot of terms or high term frequencies and it will underweight small documents. How do you fix that? You just plug in that formula here that tilts the curve and diminishes uh, what it is for the long documents and, uh, and uh, makes it higher for the small documents. You just fix this little imperfection in there. Okay? This is already advanced, so you, you really don't need to know the details. So what did I give you? I gave you a menu where you can pick one of five TF schemes, one of three DF schemes, and one of four normalization, right? And we've seen that we've used the TF, the, the one of the five that is just linear, that just uses the TF. Here we've used the IDF until now, and here we've used the Euclidean uh, norm, but actually, in total, there's five times three, 15 times four, 60 different combinations of that. What I've shown you is just one single combination. Okay? But now you can make your choice. And actually, there is a very beautiful notation for that because you probably notice that if you look at the titles, there's little letters in there, right? You see? N, L, B, A, L, N, and so on. So you can actually use these letters here and encode the scheme you pick. So if you have one letter here, one letter here, one letter here, that's three letters. This is for the query, for the query TDFs and DFs. This is for the documents. So what you have here is simply this. Oh, sorry, first the document, not the query. What that means is here we use the augmented term frequency, one of the five. Here we use the inverted document frequency, the standard one. And here we use cosine normalization with the Euclidean norm. And then for the query weights, we use sublinear term frequency. That's what the L means. Natural document frequency for uh, the document frequency and byte size normalization. It's just one of 60 times 60 combinations. So it's actually 3,600 different combinations. And this is a very convenient way of saying what scheme you are actually taking. You will have some exercises. You will program something and will ask you to express in the smart notation what you've just been programming, right? But very often, if you have one thing to remember, very often we just use the TFIDFs with the Euclidean norm. That's it, for the documents. And for the query, what we typically do is, for the term frequency, we use the Boolean version. But because in the query, you typically don't repeat the terms, so we use the Boolean version. We use one for the IDF, so we don't use any IDF on the query side. And uh, well, for the query normalization, we will see that actually we don't care about it at all. So uh, I will come back to that. So I threw a lot of curves at you and a huge restaurant menu at you. I hope I didn't scare you too much. Who understood what's going on here? OK, I, I just told you there is choice in the way you pick your weights. That's all I told you. And then I've shown you various combinations. OK, great. So now. Let's jump to series eight, but series eight is actually just taking some optimization to the next level. So it will not be a big change. Um, I told you correctness first, and then we try to make it faster, more efficient, and so on. This is what we are doing now. I'm going to go back to what we did here, this way of summing up things. And I'm just going to show you how we can make it even better, even faster. And somebody already, uh, you did in the first hour, suggested a way to make it faster by just throwing out the terms that appear in all documents. Yes, that is one way of making it faster. And we will actually see it in that lecture. Sometimes I even, I'm even wondering why, why I even made it a separate series. But maybe it's good in order to structure, like we separate officially uh, correctness for performance. So. Maybe it's a good thing to separate. OK, so uh, yeah, I cannot show, show you enough of that, because you really need to be aware of the difference between Boolean retrieval and ranked retrieval. Uh, I, can, I can skip this, right? The wrap-up. Who wants me to skip the wrap-up? 
Very good, so you don't need it. It's very good if you learn, you see it all over and over and over again, but this is what we've been doing here. Okay, so the abstraction, bag of word, and so on. The vector space model, the standard inverted index, this is what we've been doing in the last hour with this ugliness here. This is nothing else than the ATD that I have here, right? This is the one we are going to improve, by the way, and the smart notation. Okay, now let's jump to the uh, actual meat of the course. So let's get back to this. Can we improve something right here? Who has some ideas? You already told me we can just drop the, uh, anything that, that is in all documents, all the terms in all documents. Do you have any other ideas? Let me make it a question. Let me formulate it in a different way. I'm giving you ideas how you can optimize, and I'm asking to you which one is not a good idea or not a way to optimize. We could drop the query length. It's constant anyway, so why would we bother using the query length inside this term here? Or we could divide by document length, not in every single term in there, but just at the end. That would make it faster. Or maybe we can sort the document IDs in the index by term frequency, and that way it's more efficient in order to traverse the document list. Or we could replace all the term frequencies with one on the query side, because why, why would be why would you be repeating your words in a query? I mean, if you type a query on Google, you don't probably don't repeat your terms several times. So you can just, on the document side, in this smart notation, for the, for the term frequency, just use a one if it is in the query or a zero if it is not. So one of these four is actually just made up and is not something that we do. The other three are actually optimizations that work in practice. So pick the other one out. Seven. Who needs more time? Need more time? Nobody? So let me, I will not close it, but just show you the answer. Yes, you are actually correct. This is the one that doesn't make sense, sorting document IDs. And the other three, I will come right back at it, because it's all on the slides. So the first thing we can do, so that we already saw, right? The doubles are hard to compress, so instead of having the TF-IDF in there, we separate. This we saw in the last lecture. So we, we store the, the TF-IDFs separately, the TF here, the IDF, and the fact that you pre-compute the log or not, I leave out of that, okay? So, then what's next? The query length is totally useless. We want to sort by these buckets, so the query length is just a constant factor. We don't care about it. So we can just drop the query length. We don't need it, right? What's next? What's next is that the division by document length we don't need to do it every time. Like every time we have a term in document, we divide by document length and then plus it in there. We can do it at the end. We can just put this into the bucket and at the very end, we divide the, the sum of the bucket by the document length, right? We only need to do the division once that way. It's just the distributivity of the division compared to the addition, that's all it is. Then, oh, that's a very good one. We don't actually need to maintain a billion accumulators. We only need accumulators for the documents that actually appear in the terms that are in the query, right? So we can have much less accumulators in there. Instead of a billion, maybe we just have a hundred, or maybe, I don't know, much less than in reality. So we have much less accumulators to actually maintain in there. 
If we had the others, it's just that they're useless because nothing is going to ever get added to them. So why would we, why would we bother having them at all? Okay, so we've already considerably simplified. There is an, another one. So I told you that in the smart notation here, I'm assuming the TF, IDF, Euclidean normalization, but I'm telling you here essentially that for the query, TQ in there, very careful, term query, we drop this because in the query, we just have zero or one, either it's in the query or not. So what we have in there. And typically for IDF, we don't need to multiply it twice. I mean, on the query side, for this item on the menu, we just pick the uh, one that we just multiply by one. So all we need to do is just this to put in the bucket, right? It already makes it much, 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 much simpler, right? That's a pretty good way of making it faster, right? Okay. So who, who followed me on this? Very good. So now here's something more, and that's yet another exercise sheet. The last one, programming assignment, I told you now for the programming assignment, we reach the end. It's the inexact top K document retrieval. And we take it to the next level. So what we are doing here, we are trying to compute this cosine this cosine similarity between the query and the documents, but the posting lists can be extremely large in essence. So there's many, many accumulators to maintain. So there's way we already saw that we, we could maintain only accumulators for, the, for the, um, the documents that are already used, but we can do much better than that. Because what have we been doing all along when we want to retrieve the top K documents sorted by this formula here, we want the top 10. But this space here is huge. It's absolutely all documents. We can make it smaller by only taking the documents that appear in the posting list for the terms of the query. But what if we could even pre-select them to something even smaller for in some way? Imagine that I have a, a magic way of giving you a pre-selected set of documents, much smaller, and all you need to do is compute this cosine here over that limited set of documents. What's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence is this here. We lose this. We, we would have maybe relevant documents here in the top 10 that we would have had. But if we pre-select the documents, we will miss that part and only return a different top 10. So we only do that and we have an inexact top 10. And actually, it turns out that this works really well to do it that way. And the reason is very simple. It's that what we've been doing here with the cosine is already an approximation of reality. Because here, we assumed that the cosine is a very good way of measuring the similarity between a query and a document and sorting by it. It's already an approximation. So if we add another approximation, we will have a different top K, an inexact top K. But in practice, it's very, very good. It's still very good for the user, and they will not really notice. OK, so this is why. And now for the rest of this series, I will start today, finish next week. We will do inexact top K. We'll focus on pre-selecting documents and only computing the top 10 in this smaller set. Who understands that it's much faster because it's smaller? Very good. So here's ways to do that. We have a query, ETH Zurich and School, for example. And is not a Boolean query. It's really just a word. Um, we could sort them by IDF. So again, here at the start of the lecture, we put the document frequency, but in ranked retrieval, we tend to put the IDF instead, or N divided by the F. So here I'm using these bars in order to just express the numbers, just so you saw how, how they sort. And this is the wonderful idea that one of you already gave us. We can just throw away the ones that have a very low IDF or even have an IDF of zero. We just throw them away. We can even throw away the small ones, the small IDFs. So what we can do here is, for example, end and school may be very frequent. So we throw them away and just query for ETH Zurich because this has a higher IDF. There, there you go. So we drop the other ones. What we do here is that we reduce the number of terms that we sum on. We throw away part of the table. You can see that it makes it much faster to sum on. That's one first way of doing that. Here's a second idea that you can use. We have this huge posting list. 
maybe there's going to be documents they are nicely sorted by document ID here maybe this document here has all four terms this is a very good document right has all four terms probably it's going to be a good candidate to return but maybe we are going to have some documents that are only contained into one term maybe just this one it's a stop word not really surprising so we drop the documents containing only a few terms and that's it so what we do here is we just cut we throw away that part here keep that part and we remove all the documents that are in very few posting lists who understands this that's the second way I'm just throwing at you ways to make things better and to optimize so what we are doing here is we, we are reducing the space of the documents that we consider and take the top k out of them you can do it with the intersection algorithm the, way, the one we've been doing in the first week and then and I will end on that one we can have champion lists champion lists means that instead of sorting here by document ID which we've, which we've been doing until now in advance before building the index you sort them by term frequencies so you use the TF and you sort them so I'm using these bars so that you can really have a visual on that and you take the top R R is some number that you decide statically and you keep the top R documents statically when you build the index so you, you mark the top R documents and at runtime you only intersect them so again you see this reduces the number of documents we consider yes you, you mean the number R can you repeat your question each one yes I, I sort each posting list by decreasing TFs I do it statically when I build the index and I take the top R and then I, I, I basically keep some way so somewhere that top R document for each term that I have here I have it statically it's in the index at runtime I will only consider these top R documents in every in every single posting list in every in my index right is it clear so this is the champions list and I will probably stop here what's the difficulty here you need to do it statically because the order of the documents is term dependent so you do not want to have the index actually sorted that way because then you can no longer use the intersection algorithm the intersection algorithm only works because the order is by document ID is the same order everywhere right so think about that maybe until next week why you have to really maintain that top R statically and, and not at runtime uh, okay so just oh oh I need to copy it over just to make sure that you uh -huh. check that you understood uh, just to check if you understood I tried to make it as smooth as possible we will continue next week on that a few more to optimize there's much less slides than usual in this part eight so there's not much more to actually uh, consider and then I will take you to the beautiful world of probabilities and random variables and show you a completely different model of uh, in order to model the uh, information retrieval something completely new that is not a boolean retrieval or the vector space model um, there will be a lot of formulas a lot of formal mathematical formulas I will try to make it as smooth as possible so that you understand step by step uh, with visuals okay I could actually I'm always a bit nervous when I look at that okay yes very good so it is expected that uh, some of you maybe are in the uh, 50 to 79 percent bucket do not hesitate to talk to each other do not hesitate to send us emails in order to ask anything that isn't clear we are here to help and maybe there's also very good questions uh, that you that you find and that we can investigate do not hesitate to reach out do not hesitate to talk to each other so if you don't understand something ask one of your colleagues because it's a very good exercise to explain something to other people because it makes it even more rock solid that you master the topic 
So uh, thank you very much. This week you have, I think, the vector space model, the third graded week of exercises, and then the rhythm will slightly go down. You will have some of your time back. You can have m less pressure. So thank you very much. I'll see you uh, next week at uh, 9 a.m. in the same room.